I was already a nomad as a young girl when I used to daydream as I gazed at the enticing white road leading off under a more brilliant sun into the delicious unknown. For me, it seems that by advancing into unknown territories, I enter into my life. Words written at the end of the last century by the writer Isabel Eberhardt, who though born a Russian, escaped from Europe in her late teens to travel through Algeria and Morocco. Recreating herself as a man, she converted to Islam and traveled without money or protection, purging her past and in perpetual pursuit of a new beginning. My journey is an attempt to trace her own, not literally to follow in her footsteps, but to seek out the traces of this elusive and enigmatic woman, look for clues about her, understand a little better who she was behind the myth. To start then, I went to Geneva, to Eberhardt's birthplace in the city which served as a springboard for her escapades. In her journal, she wrote of her childhood here almost exclusively as miserable, suffocatingly narrow-minded. Why? Despite its associations with affluence, order and timekeeping, the city also offered refuge to countless political refugees from a turbulent Europe at the end of the last century, her own family included. What remains, a century later, of the city she knew that will throw light on why she shot out of it as soon as she could? Early photos show her already in disguise. Her father was a Russian anarchist whose utopian ideas about girls' education led him to raise her as a boy, teach her six languages, and instill in her a profound contempt for orthodoxy and convention. So why does a girl brought up as an atheist come to convert to Islam? And why does the daughter of an anarchist growing up in this free and democratic city come to reject all interest in worldly political affairs? On the face of it, you needn't look far in present-day Geneva to have a sense of what a rebellious spirit might have found stifling about it. It presents itself as a prosperous, hygienic and methodical city, preoccupied with commerce and the creation of wealth. Poverty appears to be an outlaw. It seems a place confident in its own identity in whose myriad spotless windows and gleaming surfaces its citizens see their own fixed images reflected back at themselves, reminding them perhaps at all times of who they are. I find myself wondering how you would survive here if you were not a traveler in straight lines, did not aspire to what the city seems to stand for, if you sought to dismantle who you'd been told you were in order to discover other truths about yourself. I've also come here to meet a man who's been obsessed by Isabel Eberhardt all his life. He's a newspaper editor who first read about Eberhardt when he was 12 and was inspired by the story of her North African adventures. Claude Richaud. L'image de cette femme m'a complètement hanté. Et je peux dire que parmi les femmes que j'ai beaucoup aimées dans ma vie, il y a Isabelle Eberhardt. Elle a été pour moi une, une révélation de quelque chose qui était au fond de moi, que j'avais envie de faire, et c'est la raison pour laquelle, à peu près à l'âge où elle est partie au Sahara, je suis parti au Sahara, sur euh, un peu ses traces, pour vivre l'aventure du désert. Parce que j'avais ressenti que dans son, son subconscient, Elle recherchait quelque chose que je recherchais moi-même. Elle avait beaucoup plus de talent et c'est une femme 
qui était hanté par plein de choses, mais pour moi, euh, trouver le désert, c'était en somme trouver une raison d'exister, de, de me retrouver, de finir, finalement faire une sorte de peeling spirituel. Vous voyez oui. euh, Et vous savez maintenant, quand je rencontre quelqu'un, au bout d'un quart d'heure, je sais si cette personne est allée au désert ou pas. I wondered what remained of the Russian exile community of which Eberhardt was part. It's hard to gauge after a hundred years of intermarriage and absorption. In the Russian Orthodox Church, the three priests conducting the service outnumbered the congregation of two. Her father had at one time been a priest of this denomination before vehemently unfrocking. It struck me that his rejection of the Russian Church may have been a precursor to her rejection of the whole community. Isabel Eberhardt first set foot in North Africa in May 1897, aged 20. On the day of her departure from Europe, she wrote, the weather is gray and stormy and dark. Where am I going? Where destiny is taking me. She was to cross this water several times. When arriving in Algiers from Europe, she wrote always with exhilaration. I had that feeling of well-being, of rejuvenation I always get when reaching the blessed coast of my African fatherland. But elsewhere, she writes with loathing of Algiers. Why the schizophrenia? Algeria was out of bounds to us due to the outbreak of fundamentalist activity, so I came to Tangier to look for the answer. Well, here we are, first steps on African soil. Although the very, very first thing you see when you come through the gates of the port is this front of now rather faded 19th century French architecture. So you get an immediate sense of the town's history. Now happily sort of recolonized by the town's inhabitants. I don't know whether we're going to find in late 20th century Tangier anything that relates to her arrivals in late 19th century Algiers. But it's amazing how only 12 miles across the Straits from Spain, you immediately get a sense of having arrived in a completely different culture, with Europe clearly visible over the water. Cecil Beaton used to come here a lot and described it as an oriental Cheltenham, which I've never understood. But actually, if you think of what this place was like 100 years ago, with a lot of muslin and parasols wandering up and down, you begin to get a sense of what he was talking about. It was a part of town, I think, that... I'm about to get killed. <laughs> It was a part of town which, uh, which the uh, Arabs were not allowed into. But now the place is teeming. And actually it comes as something of a relief after the rather quite somber, sedentary nature of Geneva to be here. I headed up the hill into the Kasbah. Straight away, you know you've left the certainties of Europe behind. The first thing Isabel would do on arrival was to slough off her European identity. Dressed in her male Arab persona of Si Mahmoud, she would slip off into the old Arab quarter to lounge on cafe floors, smoke the keef to which she became addicted, pick up a lover, and luxuriate in male companionship and conversation. Walking here, I understood why she felt the need for disguise in order to feel a part of it. On the one hand, life appears to be lived out to the full in public. In these communal spaces, the tasks of daily existence are visibly pursued all around you. On the other hand, you have the sense of being utterly shut out of it. You have no idea what's going on inside the houses, behind blind windows and dark doorways, beyond the shaded alleys. Eberhardt loved the secretiveness of this architecture. Boxes within boxes, protected by a subtle system of exits and entrances, reflecting what she loved about the Arab character. Proud, impenetrable, and discreet. I felt it would remain impenetrable unless, like her, I had the capacity to submerge into it. And necessary, too, to be male. Though women are in evidence going about their business, the town seems to belong to the men. 
As a European and a woman, I am doubly locked out. At the top of the town, surrounded by the clamorous streets of the Medina, lies an English churchyard as dappled and secluded as any you might find in a Hampshire village. Tangier has, for centuries, been a focal point for foreigners in search of a quick fix of exoticism, who stay only as long as appetite dictates and then move on. But it's also been famous for its magnetic powers on those for whom, like Isabel, the attraction that first drew them to North Africa became compulsive. The English-speaking community, at one time quite sizable, is now reduced to only about 150, many of whom have already booked their burial plot up here. I dropped into St Andrew's Church out of idle curiosity, really, to have a peek at those who came and, for whatever reason, stayed to bed themselves in, the living and the dead. Hello. Thank you very much. How do you do? I'm Mustafa. Mustafa, Working hello. Working here. English and Arabic. English you know, and Arabic. Yes, uh -huh. Sultan Mulay Hassan, grandfather. Mulay Hassan, Morocco. Speak English, English speak Mulay Hassan. Remember English and Arabic, Christian. You know, but he 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 built this church. Or yes, what? hundred one years. Check right. Thank uh -huh. you very much. And you are you you look after the church. Yes. Or? Mustafa, can you show me around at all? Um, some yes. of the uh, graves and. Yes, uh, Walter Harris grave. I'd love to see. Yes, Walter very Harris nice. Grave. Have a look now. You can show me. Thank you, you very much. Yes, yes, please. Right. Thank right. you. Walter Harris was an English writer, a contemporary of Isabel's, who also travelled widely through Morocco and immersed himself in the culture. Thank Are you, you um, a Christian yourself? Yes, Mustafa? thank you. <laughs> yes. And the water oh, is great. Uh -huh. English and Arabic. Been here. Front Morocco. You know. English. Yeah. English oh, and Arabic. That, oh, I see. That's yes. the inscription in Arabic. Yes, thank uh -huh. you. Many, uh -huh. many years been here in Morocco. In the Bible, Arabic. In hand Arabic. She loves Arabic. Harris. He dressed as an Arab. Yes. And he spoke Arabic. A bit. Yes, thank you. When did thank he you. die, Mustafa? I think, um, look. 19. Uh, yes, and look in here. Because the Times correspondent. Thank you very much. I think so. 1933. Yes, thank oh. you. So you didn't know him? Yes. The same me. What do you mean? You were born in Yes. You were born in the same. Oh, you were born in 1933. Yes. Yes. So you just <laughs> missed each other. This right. lovely, very nice. I so enjoyed meeting Mustafa that when I left, I kissed him on both cheeks. Goodness, said a tweed-skirted member of the congregation who observed it. How very brave. I thought it might be time to leave Tangier. The excitement I felt in its otherness on arrival was beginning to pall. For so long shaped to serve the needs of all those passing through, maybe it no longer quite knows who or what it is. Perhaps here's the clue to Isabel's schizophrenia about Algiers, where, after her joy at being on African soil again had worn off, she wrote, Vast space and emptiness, a blinding light, are what makes a landscape African. The architecture of Algiers boasts none of those traits. The uninitiated European thinks those men in dirty burnouses over tattered European clothes are all part of the local colour. But it is contrary to Arab custom. Oh, how evil civilization is. Why was it ever brought over here? Sharing her hunger for a more authentic African landscape, I left for Fez. Pretty soon, I'm brought up short by my own preconceptions. Throughout the four-hour ride south, the view remains relentlessly familiar. It could almost be the lowland pastures of Isabel, Switzerland. So what was I expecting? And what did she mean by a true Arab landscape? Aren't we both guilty of bringing some mythic concept of the Arab world to our travels? So we reject what we find if it doesn't seem to fit, seeing it as inauthentic. But the Berber woman next to me is a reminder that in this country, many worlds coexist and always have done. It wasn't until this century that Morocco emerged as a nation state. Before this, it was a patchwork of internecine tribes. The Arab sultans only ever controlled the northern plains and ports. The rest, 
The mountain ranges of the Rif and Atlas and the desert south belonged to the Berbers, the pre-Arab inhabitants, who seldom recognized anything more than local tribal authority, and still don't. The only unifying element in this patchwork has been Islam. As night fell, we arrived in Fez, historically one of the holiest cities in the Islamic world. The French called the city Fez la Mysterieuse, and it's not hard at first sight to see why. Wrapped around by its ancient wall, virtually impenetrable by car, it seems reluctant to unrobe itself to the visitor. Even from above, it's hard to get a sense of its internal shape, lying shrouded under its own roofscape, punctuated only by the minarets of its 320-odd mosques. The most complete medieval city of the Arab world, it appears to have rejected European infiltration as wholeheartedly as Tangier has embraced it. Plunging for the first time into its maze of twisting alleys, I felt like Alice in Wonderland, outsized and out of time. Apart from the electric light bulb, there's nothing to indicate the arrival of the 19th, let alone the 20th century. The streets are lined with tiny workshops where the raw materials of the land are fashioned into artifacts with tools and methods unaltered since medieval times. These skills though bone-achingly arduous, are practiced with a deafness, a sensuality even, that speaks of centuries of continuity. It came as a relief after Tangier. The concentration, the indifference to the visitor, the sense of the past alive in the present, made me feel, paradoxically, less shut out. of coexisting extremes, of darkness and light, noise and silence, permanence and decay, revelation and concealment. As with the circuitous nature of Arab conversation, there are 50 possible ways to get from A to B. Moving along the dark, dense and hectic alleyways where two mules constitute a traffic jam, it's impossible to guess at the expansive, calm and luminous spaces that lie behind the walls. Luckily, I have a guide. Abdel Latif El Hajami is an architect responsible for restoring many of the Medina's threatened Islamic buildings and understands, perhaps better than anyone, the connection between Islamic philosophy and its architectural form. Where are we going? What is this place? This is uh, Madrasa. It's a building from the 14th century. It's a building for uh, students. Students were living there. And uh, these students were looking, asking for knowledge. The first verse of the Quran says, Iqra, read. 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 Because knowledge is one of the central activities in the Islamic society. And this monument is one of the famous monuments of the 14th century. And that's the mosque? Then. And this is the mosque here. And we have the room for the students. And we have public bath near it. So it's kind of cultural complex, integrated with the life of the quarter, because everyone can come and makes the private here. So it's public area and also private area.
this color here is the color of uh, very close to nature, very close to what we see in the wood, wooden color and so on. The, uh, the, the blue is also very typical, especially in the uh, in Fez architecture. If we now consider the uh, type of decoration and its limits, we can see the, the scale. And this scale is human scale in kind of we, our limit is under the top of it. This style is what we call the Andalusian style or the arabo moresque typology, which has tiles down and after plaster, after wood, and the sky, which participates to the whole. The sky is a part of the architecture. It's, the universe is part of the architecture. that water always plays a part in Islamic architecture. What's the reason for that? Water is for purification in the uh, Islamic meaning. So before that anyone makes his prayer, he purifies himself. There's a precise order in the way parts of the body are washed. And if you're somewhere where water is not available, you can perform the ritual with sand or even stone. There's something very adaptable portable in Islamic religious practice. Isabel Eberhardt took great pleasure in its ritualized disciplines. She wrote, to be healthy in body, pure of all stains after bathing in clear water, to be simple and to believe, never to have doubted, never to have battled against oneself. That is peace. That is Muslim happiness. And who knows, perhaps it's also wisdom. I was struck by the discretion of Islamic architecture. Unlike many Christian churches and cathedrals, often built to tower above or stand apart, the mosques and madrasas of Fez are absorbed discreetly into the body of the city, reflecting a synthesis of religion into daily life. This combination in Islam of the practical and the spiritual must have been part of its appeal to Isabel. Her joining of a Sufi brotherhood, the Kadriya, was motivated by this dual gain, I'm sure. The Kadriya were a Sufi order within Islam devoted to a mystical tradition, but operated also as a kind of social club. As a member, she was guaranteed hospitality and protection wherever she encountered others. Useful for a single woman traveling with no money. The sense of belonging, too, was perhaps a source of solace to her who had neither family nor home. Today, at a gathering of the Kadriya in Fez, I was only allowed a few minutes to watch, standing behind the boundary line allotted to non-members, mystified by what I witnessed. I notice that the women, though present, are not participants. Easy to see why Isabel could not have played an active part in the Kadriya as a woman. I was leaving Fez without understanding what I'd just seen. Within the city, I'd met Latifa Lagzawi, an anthropologist who writes on the changing role of women and religion in Morocco. I hoped she might be able to throw some light on Sufism for me and what its significance may have been for Isabel. We set off for Marrakesh in the noisiest bus in the world. I think Isabel Eberhardt was the first European woman to join a Sufi Brotherhood. Was it very unusual, do you think, for a woman to be initiated into the Kadiriya? Actually, Sufism has got um, treats women as equally, more equally in a sense than, than so-called orthodox uh, Islam. 
because the whole, I mean, the idea behind Sufism is that it is a mystical experience. It is a very personal and deep experience that anybody um, who is willing or who is seeking the light of God can go through. When you seek in the light of God, when you seek in the union with God, um, it's like you give up your worldly goods, you give up your uh, um, attachment to the daily realities, and and you become somebody who's just seeking. It doesn't matter who you are, in a sense. But in, in general, women are as well accepted in, in Sufism as, as men. There is absolutely no. Um, discrimination in, in that sense. That's very interesting is it, in relation to her because although I always feel that although she was dressed as a man it was not because she wanted to be a man or behave mm. like a man it was in a way to be more of a woman mm. you know like like Shakespeare's heroines who dress up as men not not in order to change their natures but in order to be able to understand and discover their natures that as women they can't. Yeah. very specific about the importance of love and sex and sensuality and I think that's something that the Prophet has has, uh, has talked about him, and you find it in his um, in writings about what the Prophet did in all his traditions but he was symbolizing the, the, the perfect lover in a sense he's, he's reported to have been extremely uh, tender towards his women to have a, a very full and, and sort of blossoming sexuality and was Rather graphic in his description of uh, lovemaking and, and really, it's a bit of a veiled world, it's a man's world. Isabel was very drawn to the idea of suffering, and even sorted out, and she was often preoccupied with notions of death. Does this find some reflection in Sufism? See, it's not so much Sufism, but it's Islam in general, where, um, which sees death as, as a gift from God. Once you die, then you you're reunited with God. Um, so the end of death is not negative in that sense. It has, um, it's, um, it marks a beginning, but a new beginning, which is a reunion with God. The suffering and pain are not, are not negative feelings. They're not, um, they're not something that you run away from. Um, you bear them because and, and you even enjoy them because that's what Allah has to put you through. It's like a test from Allah. Uh, so there's some sweetness in suffering. Oh, yes. After eight hours of bouncing around on the bus talking to Latifa, certain choices of Isabel's are beginning to make sense. She was a Russian by birth, and I was reminded suddenly of those characters in Chekhov's plays, direct contemporaries of hers who are defined by their fatalistic attitude towards hardship and defeat. Islam means, in Arabic, submission. Maybe in becoming a Muslim, some genetic Russian tendency of hers towards the resignation of hope found some reflection. Maybe there's even a connection in the fact that she was raised as an anarchist, whereby the rejection of political doctrine and the stress on individual action finds a kind of spiritual echo in Sufism, which also rejects the doctrinaire and emphasizes the personal. As the sun was setting, I thought it small wonder that Isabel became intoxicated by this country's land and skyscapes. Everything she did here, she did to extremes, yielding herself up not only to religion, but to her physical and sensual appetites, keef smoking among them. Arriving in Marrakesh, famously a magnet for sensation seekers, I'd thought that we might investigate those aspects of her here. But perhaps because of its cult status, it proved difficult to observe. In its legendary central square, the theme is performance for the tourist. But evidence of keef smoking is hard to find, since officialdom now frowns upon it. Keef, though, has long been part of North African culture. As pastime and palliative, but also in religious ritual to induce trance and shift perception. Isabel wrote a short story on the subject, undoubtedly autobiographical, called The Oblivion Seekers. The 
Keith smokers move in and form groups. Squatting along the wall on the mat, they smoke their little pipes of baked red earth, filled with Indian hemp and powdered Moroccan tobacco. Haji Dries stuffs the bowls and distributes them, after having carefully wiped the mouthpiece on his cheek as a gesture of politeness. When his own pipe is empty, he picks out the little red ball of ash and puts it into his mouth. He does not feel it burning him. Then, once his pipe is refilled, he uses the still red-hot cinder to relight the little fire. For hours at a time, he does not let it once go out. His dreams are nourished on the narcotic smoke. The seekers of oblivion sing and clap their hands lazily. Their dream voices ring out late into the night. Then, little by little, the voices fall, grow muffled. The words are slower. Finally, the smokers are quiet and merely stare at the flowers in ecstasy. They are epicureans, voluptuaries. Perhaps they are sages. Even in the darkest purlieu of Morocco's underworld, such men can reach the magic horizon where they are free to build their dream palaces of delight. Up then into the high atlas, the spine of the country that divides the northern plains from the desert south. For the first time in Morocco, I found myself out in the open, in a landscape uncloistered by walls and shadows. The village of Aremd sits about 1,800 meters up in the atlas, at the foot of the highest peak, Jebel Tubkal, the mountain of mountains. Beyond the reach of the automobile, and faced with an hour's hike up through fresh snow, I took shameless advantage of being six months pregnant and hitched a mule ride. This is the heartland of the Berber people, the oldest inhabitants of North Africa. When the French began their pacification policy in the 1920s, the Atlas Berber's way of life was essentially feudal, controlled by three great clan families, who struggled to hold out against French domination for nearly 20 years. Today, the Berber villages retain a large measure of independence. They're not generally taxed. The role of the state is minimal, and government is through a system of local caïds. The people of these villages take great pride in their separateness and self-determination. No Arabic is spoken here. They retain their own three dialects, their particular version of Islam, and their own cultural traditions. Music and dance are a big feature and tend to happen fairly spontaneously. If the men are bored or feel the impulse, they call to the unmarried girls of the village to join them. And if there's a consensus, festivities begin. The dance is structured round a wide circle, the men and women singing a call and response to each other across the arena. I was told that the essence of a sung exchange here is that the men call for God to help them and the women reply that all will be well. But watching it, that didn't seem to be all that was going on. It was good to see the young women here going unveiled and seeming freer through the dance to communicate a sensuality unthinkable among the traditional Arab communities. Moving on, over the high pass and down the southern slopes of the Atlas towards the desert, it's astonishing how quickly and dramatically the landscape changes, drying out, paring down, as though with every dozen miles or so, the earth sheds another layer of skin.
This is the beginning of the Moroccan Sahara, a wide expanse of stone and scrub. As the land drops down, the adrenaline rises, sensing the pull of what's beyond. Space begins to open up, skies widen. Time begins to have less significance, to stretch. Crossing a stark, dry plateau in the Jebel Saro range, we were heading for a rendezvous with a family belonging to the Eight Atta tribe. The Eight Atta are the super tribe among the nomadic Berbers of the Atlas, whose diverse territories stretch from the snow-covered heights of the range down to the Sahara. Traditionally, the pattern of their journeying is defined by grazing needs and trading posts. Summer spent in the grasslands of the high peaks, winter on the edge of the desert. But the head of this family feels too old to do that now, so he contains their travels to the lower slopes and plateaus of the range throughout the year, staying sometimes up to three months in one place. So the family is divided between a settled and a nomadic existence. Salam alaikum. Juliet. Juliet. I was introduced to Ali Louche and other men of the family, but not, I noticed, to the women. We spent a day walking with the family, a luxurious amount of time within the schedule of a documentary film crew, an irony which resonated loudly in the company of people for whom time is measured at the pace of footsteps. But in searching through this country for traces of Isabel Eberhardt, I felt at last I'd struck a nerve. An insatiable wanderer herself, her time in the South was spent largely in the company of nomadic people, as guides and companions, and they were the source of much of what she most felt akin to and eased by, often providing the material of her richest writing. To travel is not to think, but to see things in succession, with one's life sensed in the measure of space. The monotony of landscapes slowly unrolling soothes our cares, infuses us with lightness and quiet, which the fever traveller could never know on his full-speed excursions. At the unhurried pace of horses stunned by the heat, the smallest accidents of the journey preserve their startling beauty. A calm and vital state of mind rules, which once belonged to all human races and is still preserved among us in the blood of nomads. But the rhythms of this day have their own volatility. As dusk fell, a sense of sharpening need set in to enclose the animals, set up camp and eat. With astonishing speed and deftness, the night's accommodation for both family and flocks was organized. I thought of why it may have been that Isabel Eberhardt so passionately identified with them. Their self-reliance, their capacity to exist with only the barest of necessities, their tough sensuality seems to lend them a virility and dignity which are the mark of their freedom. Disempowered as she felt by city life and its obsessive materialism, perhaps among these people she sought to shake off old dependencies, toughen her body and strengthen her spirit, in order to realize the potential that she sensed in herself, which was weakened by urban existence. <laughs> Standing redundantly on the sidelines, footsore and shivering with cold, I was pretty conscious of my own enfeeblement by city life.
Over preparations for supper, a single loaf of bread, and as I began to droop, the tireless Ali Louche started to tell some of his stories. By and large, Berber history is not written down, and there's virtually no literature. So the oral tradition remains rich and prevalent, a tapestry of fact and a myth. Both in style and content, many of Eberhardt's own stories drew strongly from this tradition. We headed further south, into the Sahara, deeper into the landscape Eberhardt was most lured by. But she was nothing if not paradoxical. She loved and identified with the people of the south, but came to work for the French general most responsible for colonizing North Africa, who was attempting to bring such people into line with French notions of civilization. So her travels down here were driven partly by pragmatism. As a Sufi, she was able to gain access to Zawiyas, centers of religious and political authority, which in these desert regions were resistant to French plans. As a kind of mole, she was supposed to use her influence to encourage their compliance. But in the event, she seldom fulfilled the brief, having little heart for it, and being easily seduced by her surroundings. Following the course of the river Dra, we reached the small oasis town of Tamgrut. In the pattern of many desert towns, a group of fortified kasbahs cluster around the building that lies at its heart, the Zawiya. Zawiyas are to be found all over North Africa. Founded by the Sufi brotherhoods and often built around the tomb of a saint, they exist as both spiritual and social centers. This is one of the most prestigious in the country, combining many functions. Its central courtyard offers refuge to the sick and mentally ill many of whom come to live here, cardboard city style, for years in hope of cure. And its rich library preserves a number of early Qurans written on gazelle hide, brought on camelback from Mecca. The once powerful Arab clan of the Nasseri have governed here for centuries. The current sheikh, a gentle and hospitable octogenarian, welcomed us to tea, and I asked him about the qualifications required for someone wanting to study here, and how a European like Eberhardt would go about converting to Islam. 
احنا دوك فين ما يخصوا اللي جات بسمتين وطالب علمين ما نقول لها ما نقول لها ما كانش يدين في الدنيا اللي سهل بحال الاسلام والاسلام احنا الاسلام عنده خمسة الاركان خمسة بحال اصابع الاولى فيهم هي شهادة لا اله الا الله وان محمد رسول الله يقول يقولها الانسان بلسانه بالعباره بالعباره بالعربيه لا بد فهمت وخالد عبد الفتاح الجنابي بالانجليزيه لا بد بالعربيه والثانيه هو الصلاه لا بد يصلي والثالثه هي الزكاه اللي عند المول ما يزكي والرابعه هي الصيام تاع رمضان والخامسه هي الحجاج الى عالم التدريب Il habite ici, près du désert, dans cette petite ville, et, et ses ancêtres, toujours comme ça, près du désert. Est-ce qu'ils croient qu'on est, qu est plus près de, de Dieu dans le désert qu est, que, que dans les grandes villes Bonjour. والمانج بالقياس وحنا هاد الصحراء حنا حرار ديال الرزن كان نمشي موجع الهواء والاكسجين والحريات تاعنا نقول لها واحد الكلمه كاع اللي جاي كاع وجه الارض عندنا مسجد جعلوا لنا الله مسجد ما ذكرت الصلاه Isabel, often sick and always poor, made great use of Zawiya hospitality. There she was able to write profusely, finding rest and solace in seclusion and abstinence. I am the guest of these men. I shall live in the silence of their house. Already they have brought me all the calm of their spirit, and a shadow of peace has entered the recesses of my soul. Is this the life I came to find? Will all my longing finally be appeased, and for how long? I dream of a sleep that would be a death, from which one would emerge armed and strong, with a personality regenerated by forgetting. I thought of how the Zawiya might have integrated all that she needed for mind, body and spirit, offering a balance which belies the outsider's preconception of Islam as a religion of extremes. The sense of a place unaltered by time was reaffirmed in the village. As with all desert villages, human settlement is defined by water, and the business of irrigation is kept up with patience and persistence. Each family owns a small parcel of land, of which every spare inch is used to grow wheat, barley and maize, creating small explosions of rich colour amidst the monochrome of baked earth. Perhaps the struggle for existence keeps the villagers always at first base, and so impervious to fluctuations other than those of climate and acts of God. No use here for hurry and scramble, or wrestling with the hours. So time seems ample. A man will stand all day in a field with his herd, or by the road to sell a lump of mineral, or lounge to gaze at what, with no apparent objective. It was in such a place that Isabel fantasized about living. I would like to settle there and make a home a little mud house close to some date palms, a place to cultivate the odd vegetable in the oasis, a few small animals, a horse perhaps, and books as well. Fashion a soul for myself out there, an intelligence and a will. I have no doubt that my attraction to the Islamic faith would blossom magnificently over there. Surely the fatalism at the heart of Muslim faith is linked in part to geography. This is a climate of extremes, unpredictable and volatile. Drought or flood, violent storms of sand or rain may arrive at any time and wreak havoc. So how else would you cope with such life-threatening uncertainties other than by yielding up belief in self-determination? In conversation, inshallah, God willing, peppers every other thought. It was in this environment that Isabel Eberhardt met her sudden death at the age of 27. 
looking twice that, ravaged by disease, she had checked herself out of hospital and into a small mud house on the edge of the village of Einsefra, when a flash flood ripped through the place and took her life with it. It's a feature of the territory. Somewhere there is rain. A huge wall of water roars down the dry riverbed, pushing every form of life before it. Destruction is rapid, and buildings made of earth and water are reduced by water back to earth again. The very architecture seems to court its own annihilation. An appropriate end, then, perhaps, for a woman who did the same. I've often found the longing for death so intense in me that I've sometimes almost solicited it, trying to find in non-being the supreme sensual delight. It seems to me that I am skirting the inviting abyss of the void. Who knows? Perhaps I shall let myself slip into it one day, voluptuously, and without the slightest worry or concern. Here, in the highest dunes of the Moroccan Sahara, I felt we were in the heartland of the terrain that drew her. Here, the mythic realm of the imagination is realized in the geography of sky and boundless distance. Here, the curved horizon reminds you of the shape of the planet you live on. It seems a place beyond political boundaries and borders, belonging to no country or nation. For Isabel Eberhardt, for whom notions of home and nationality had little meaning, it was a universal landscape, belonging only to those who have the courage and will to survive here. Its stillness is deceptive. Though static from a distance, the sand is always moving, fluid, closing over the tracks of those who've passed. The silence is loud more than the absence of noise, an active power that absorbs and disperses any sound that intrudes upon it. And for one who was always in quest of the unreachable, it seems unknowable, obliterating memory and identity, and even purpose. Lying down, I felt dangerously that I might never think of a reason to get up again. I can sense that for her, having fallen victim to the spell of this vast and luminous space, Nowhere else on earth would be powerful enough, because it is absolute. It seems like a land at the beginning of time, some harsh Eden where there was only one of everything. Only here then, perhaps, could she create herself from scratch and start anew. If a voice shouts at me, Foreigner, European, I'll not turn around. If the voice says, you, woman, yes, woman, I'll not turn around. No, I'll not even turn my head, even when it whispers, Isabel Eberhardt, even then I won't turn around. But if it hails, you, you there, who need vast spaces and ask for nothing but to move, you alone free, seeking peace and a home in the desert, who wish only to obey the strange ciphers of your fate. Yes, then I will turn around. Then I'll answer. I am here. See si Mahmoud. On next week's Great Journey, percussionist Evelyn Glennie travels to Korea in search of its traditional art and culture.